Welcome to uh, all of you. Um, welcome to Carnegie Europe for um, a discussion on uh, on uh, something that isn't Greece, um, which I guess these days is a welcome kind of you know variety uh, for the lunch fair. Uh, I'm sure Greece will somehow seep into this because you will you will make sure that it will. Um, but originally we will not talk about it uh, and uh, and and try to give you something else to chew on. Um, um, all of this uh, started here when last year. Um, uh, towards the end of the year, uh, a couple of things happened at the same time. First of all, of course, there was started the big discussion about the strategic review process that the EU would be undergoing in terms of its foreign policy, uh, and that, um, that Federica Mogherini was really embracing the idea and that a mandate would come from the summit and then a second mandate from, from a summit this year. And so all of a sudden, everybody was talking about strategic review, neighborhood policy, and a number of other things, um, you know, all kind of wrapped together uh, and, and, you know, a big thing. Um, around the same time, uh, Bruno from the Portuguese Foreign Ministry approached us and said, we need to have a discussion and we'd like to do a workshop in Lisbon on this and really you know, ask some of the critical questions on how we can re-engineer EU foreign policy. And uh, we uh, did a great workshop in Lisbon, um, uh, co-hosted by the Portuguese Foreign Ministry in Carnegie, um, and Carnegie, uh, and, uh, and we had great results. Uh, and then the third thing that happened was that at around the same time it became clear that Pierre Vimont would be joining Carnegie Europe um, as a senior associate, um, which he is now. And, uh, and so we had kind of critical mass on the strategy thing. And we decided, OK, let's, let's uh, you know, bind this together in an intelligent way uh, and turn it into a real contribution to the debate. And that's, this is what we are here for today. Two publications came out of this, um, both of which uh, have, I think, been made available to you. Um, the first one is uh, Pierre's policy outlook that he wrote for us, which was published a few days ago. Um, the path to an upgraded EU foreign policy. And the second one is the re-engineering piece um, with some of the results and recommendations coming out of that <laughs> workshop uh, in Lisbon. And uh, we will be talking about both of these and then hopefully have a great lively discussion about this. Um, we will also have afterwards um, a small light lunch uh, with Portuguese food um, and Portuguese wine. Um, so austerity, we'll forget it for a couple of minutes at least today. <laughs> Uh, and indulge, and alcohol certainly helps in these difficult days, so we will actually <laughs> provide you with some. And um, so what we will do is that after the discussions here are over, we will remove this little wall, the chairs will be moved to the side, it will take two or three minutes, and then you can storm the buffet uh, and, and, and take in all of the calories that you will certainly need afterwards. Um, I would like to hand over to Pierre, who will start us off. Um, Pierre, of course, as you know, um, was uh, present at the creation when um, the uh, External Action Service you know, started to operate. Um, he was the um, Executive Secretary General. He's now with us. He's just accepted a new job. Uh, President Tusk has asked him to be the Special Envoy for the Malta Summit on Migration um, that will happen in November. And so uh, Pierre is really kind of torn between the hot potatoes that he likes to manage, the big crises, uh, and uh, the more scholarly work that he also likes but has so little time to do. But I'm very grateful that he did this paper for us. Um, then uh, Bruno is here with us, uh, Secretary of State for European Affairs in the Portuguese Foreign Ministry, and Sylvie Kaufmann, also known to all of you, um, doing foreign policy big time at Le Monde. So we have a real good um, panel here. Um, Pierre goes first, then Bruno comes in with some of the findings from the workshop, and then Sylvie will provide us with the common sense that all of the people involved have long lost, and then hopefully you come in as well and give us your critical opinions and questions. With this, Pierre, it's yours. Thank you, Jan, and thank you all for, for coming. Your, your reference to the food reminds me that uh, my good old days in, in Washington where we were organizing conferences followed by a dinner, and. I invited a former uh, fr uh, foreign uh, minister, French foreign affairs minister, who came. There was a big crowd, and I told him, that's great. And he told me, don't worry, I know they come for the food. <laughs> 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 Which was, on behalf of a minister, a very long humbleness that is worth uh, witnessing. I'll be very short, because I, I wrote this piece. Maybe some of you will be there, uh, daring enough to, to read it. Uh, but I would really like only to summarize some of the ideas I've, I've put forward. Um, I think I, I've tried to answer two or three questions. Uh, the first one was about foreign policy, European fo foreign policy. Why uh, are we here where we are? And I think 
my main idea was to try to look a little bit at the history of uh, the European Union and how we have built this system, which is a very strongly divided system, in fact, at the end of the day. On one side, we have the member states with what we call the common foreign and security policy, where, to be honest, member states have never been all too proactive in pushing forward that, um, that kind of classical diplomacy because they were somewhat uh, thinking about retaining as much of their sovereignty as possible there. And on the other side, you have what the Commission has done inside the realm of its uh, competences, where they have been much more proactive. And um, I think this entails two consequences that we have to look at. One, if you look at the broad picture, is that you have a strong difference of, uh, of momentum between the two. If you have on one side the actors of the CFSP giving um, you know, small, small pieces of their competence towards Brussels with some reluctance, reservation. We had some progress with the Amsterdam Treaty. We've had other progresses with the Lisbon Treaty. But at the end of the day, it's still all about unanimity. Um, it's still very much about member states being represented in all international um, um, organization and having great difficulty in accepting a sort of single representation by the EU. And if on the other side you have, as it has happened since the beginning of the, um, of the um, European project, a commission that's pushing forward to try to take as much uh, room as possible, you have this extraordinary impression of two parts and two components of the, um, of the uh, European foreign policy that are not moving ahead at the same uh, pace. And the second consequence is how our partners outside of Europe watch this. You know, for them, the main deliverables of our foreign uh, policy and of our external action have a lot to do with what the Commission has been doing, trade, um, development assistance, so on and so forth. And with regard to the main crisis we're facing today or that we have been facing in the past, they have the impression that their Europe is not maybe playing exactly at the level it should play, and they rely much more on member states individually to discuss what could be done. Uh, think about the recent Ukrainian crisis with the Normandy format, uh, Germany and France, but you could think about maybe other issues um, where uh, the same thing has, uh, has happened. Why haven't we been able to bridge that gap and to go further on? That's the second question. Lisbon has tried, and they have made some impressive innovation. Now a high representative that is also a vice president, a full-fledged administration, the EES working besides and in support of the uh, high representative vice president. Um, the right of initiative for the, uh, for, the, um, for the high representative. No more rotating presidency, to put it in simple terms, inside this whole realm of, of foreign policy. And in, in spite of all that, we have the impression that there hasn't been all that change in the system and that we're still very much stuck with, the, um, uh, with this strong division as it appears at the moment. I think one of the reasons for this, first of all, is that the mindset hasn't really changed in, 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 um, in, in Brussels. If we really want to have major improvement, both institution, the Council and the Commission, should have decided at the top level uh, that they wanted things to change. It didn't work that way. Uh, Lisbon was seen uh, on one side, I think the Commission side, as a major defeat. They lost part of the services. And on the member state side, it was maybe too much perceived, Lisbon was too much perceived as a sort of revenge against the Commission and a way for the member states to interfere with what the Commission was doing. So we have seen a lot of uh, small battles, bureaucratic battles going on and on. I think other reasons for that is also because there are some structural flows inside the, uh, and the Lisbon um, provision as they have been set up. Um, 
two or three, just to uh, give you a quick example. Nowhere have we really discussed the whole issue about what an added value from the EU point of view, from the EU side, with relation to foreign policy. There has never been a, a debate about what that meant. Uh, and therefore, we're working with this added value in a very pragmatic way without ever knowing really what it means. And we, we don't understand why, on some occasions, we decide to go for a, a military operation, a CSDP operation, and in other cases, we think it's not necessary because uh, Europe should not interfere with, with that crisis. Uh, I think the second point is that, uh, and that may change, and we all hope it will change in the near future, um, we're still not really um, assertive enough about what kind of geopolitical role we want Europe to play. Um, we discuss that from time to time among member states, but we're not so sure, and some member states are not so sure, at least, uh, that Europe should get involved in many of those crises. Um, Syria, for instance, uh, Yemen, uh, Libya. We very much prefer to leave it to the UN and to others, uh, but we don't feel that we should be part of this. Even today, in, on an issue like the Middle East peace process, it has always been a very difficult issue for the Europeans, but it seems to me, I'm talking here under the control of Mark maybe, that we were more self-assertive a few years ago in trying to push and take the initiative. We have become somewhat reluctant today and uh, don't know exactly what is the role we should play in many of these crises, which means as a sort of consequence that for the EES itself, we don't know exactly what should be the mission of the ES. Should it be a, a think tank? Uh, should it be a service in charge of uh, managing crisis precisely? Should it be something else? Um, for the time being, it has mostly replaced the rotating presidency in a sort of routine way, chairing working groups, trying to push forward. But it is lacking the, sometimes the energy that rotating presidencies had because they were there only for six months. Therefore, they were pushing their own interest as much as they could. And even if we thought that there was lacking continuity, continuity there, at least there was a little bit of momentum every six months that was popping up. With the uh, ES in charge of it month after month, year after year, we're witnessing a little bit of a routine moving in and some member states are starting to be more and more critical about this. Um, I could go on and on, but I'll stop there. And I think my third question would be, how can we improve that? And in this paper, I've tried to uh, um, uh, point out a few of them related either to working methods, to uh, launching what is precisely doing at the moment the high representative with the new security strategy, and I think this is going in the, uh, in the right direction. But I think we need maybe to go even further and be a, a little bit more creative and innovative if, if we can by looking at two or three controversial issues on which I think we need to be a more forthcoming. One is flexibility, you know, the idea that a group of member states should be leading sometimes on some issues. I think this is a good thing at the end of the day if we um, use that flexibility in the right way and if it is um, uh, being done with all the necessary safeguards, in other words, having um, inside those flexible formats a representative from the Euro European Union as such to be able to report back. But I think maybe at the end of the day, because of the law of numbers, 28 member states together, taking decision by unanimity is becoming something more and more cumbersome and more and more difficult to do. Why not try to be more flexible and to allow for more of this as, as we move along? And the second one, I think, is about priorities. We discussed that several times with, uh, with Jan, who is somewhat skeptical about this, and I understand him very well. Uh, we have managed quite often to maintain consensus about 28 member states precisely by avoiding to take any kind of priorities. But today, with our neighborhood in fire on the eastern uh, partnership or in the southern neighborhood with major crises um, in three or four very well focused places um, I think uh, I think we need uh, to uh, set up clear priorities for the years ahead and I think if we don't do that then we will become more and more an actor that is um, 
dragging behind and uh, losing some of its ground. So I think through the uh, new strategy that the High Representative is going to push forward, through the review of uh, the neighborhood policy, through the review of the post Cotonou uh, um, situation, through the review of the post-2015 sustainable development, we are at a crucial, a crush, crucial sorry, juncture where we may precisely decide altogether that we need to focus more on some priorities. So I think this is uh, very important. I've been all too long, I'll stop there. Um, I have a very quick follow-up for you, Pierre. Um, the, the one thing that I'm worried about most is that we've created all of these tools and might even be able to improve them on the, on the technical level that they operate, but without that clear purpose that you've asked for in the beginning, what role does the EU want to play geopolitically? You know, what's the value added that the EU brings to the foreign policies of the member states? Without having all of that answered, none of these improvements will make a great difference. My question to you is, do you think that this review process that is now underway can give some answers to these very fundamental questions? I think it, it gives a great opportunity, and this should be the place where we start discussing these kinds of uh, issues. Uh, whether member states will be ready to do that, what kind of process should we use to do that, it's not easy. You know, heads of state of government, foreign ministers, don't know very well how to handle those strategic issues and you know what kind of format should they have. When there are 28 around the table, it becomes very quickly a sort of bureaucratic exchange of views uh, with, uh, with no real impetus. So should it be precisely done in a, in a different way with small groups of countries uh, discussing this? I don't know, but we have to think about it because I think the initiative launched by Federica Mogherini to uh, start working on a new foreign policy strategy is the right one, and it's the right place to uh, look at those issues. Thanks, Pierre. I'd like to hand it over to uh, Bruno, who, of course, in his current position, is still knee-deep in the trenches on all of this. He's here in town not only for this event, but also because he attended uh, the summit yesterday, and, and he's a part of the daily negotiations. And it's, it's, it's very much, you know, our gain that he's here to g give us, you know, the, the real practitioners, the member states' <coughs> practitioners' perspective on all of this. Bruno. Thank you, Jan. It's been a great pleasure working with Carnegie and with you this past uh, six, seven months on this project and also discussing with you. Thank you so much. Discussing with you some of these problems. Uh, a, a quick personal note. I started on this job uh, two years ago uh, on the run-up, in the run-up to the Vilnius Summit. Uh, the preparations for the Vilnius summit, uh, and then I actually went to the Vilnius summit, summit to represent our prime minister who could not go. And so this had had, had a huge impact on me. Uh, uh, coming into the job uh, very fresh uh, and seeing how EU politics, <laughs> EU foreign policy is done, my first impression was that it could be done better. Of course, by now I've been fully socialized and I can't even remember what is wrong with EU foreign <laughs> policy anymore. <laughs> Uh, but, but hopefully this document uh, still has some of those points. Um, you, you may remember, Jan, that uh, in our first conversation on this, uh, I made the point that I was a bit puzzled by the difference between how the EU had dealt with the Euro crisis and how it was dealing with its foreign policy crisis having to do with Ukraine and Russia. That in the case of the Euro crisis, there was a deliberate effort to rethink the system. So at the same time that we were approving these bailouts and emergency measures, we were also thinking about what made the system vulnerable in the first place. And you have to do both. You have to use the system to respond to crisis, but also to reform the system and make it stronger. Uh, and so we embarked on that very ambitious project of a banking union for Europe and other measures, including also emergency funds, permanent emergency funds like the ESM. Now, uh, in the case of foreign policy, there was an immediate response using the available tools, and we can talk about whether it was a good or a bad response. Uh, I think there are actually good arguments to say that everything considered what the EU has done after Vilnius is quite positive. Before Vilnius is another discussion. Um, but there was very little, and I, still th I, I think there's still very little on the other more structural approach to a crisis how should we reform and revise the system? Uh, and I think that's still the case. And this project was an attempt to uh, put together a number of experts, insiders, uh, and think about that question in particular. So in Lisbon, 
uh, when we met last December, it's hard to believe it was uh, six months ago. Um, uh, when we met uh, uh, in December, uh, we talked only about this. We didn't talk about strategy. Uh, we didn't talk about uh, Russia or Ukraine directly, only indirectly. We were focused on how to improve the EU foreign policy system. Uh, the paper that comes out of it um, is a bit unusual, I think, formally. Uh, the participants are not mentioned. We decided to adopt a very stringent version of the Chatham House rule. Uh, we don't even mention who was there. There were uh, former foreign ministers, foreign pri uh, prime ministers, think tankers, academics, uh, people from inside the institutions, uh, the European External Action Service and others. Uh, but in order not to be forced to have a purely objective matter-of-fact report, in order to be able to start from the suggestions that were made by everyone there but build a, a sort of an argument, a coherent argument out of it, we don't mention who the participants were. Uh, and I hope they are uh, happy with that because it's ideas that matter. I see a couple of them here. Um, what are the ideas? Uh, in some respects, similar to what uh, Pierre Vimont has, has, has talked about in the initial approach. Uh, the sense that uh, the EU is not playing at the level it should play in foreign policy. Uh, the sense that uh, there hasn't been much change to the system since Lisbon. I've already talked a little bit about uh, that sense that the system is uh, not responding to the crisis. It's responding to the crisis, but it's not responding to the crisis in a structural way. Uh, EU's geopolitical role, I think this is present also in the Lisbon paper, the idea that we're going to face probably a decade or two of high geopolitics. Uh, I think this is becoming clearer and clearer to everyone. It's becoming clearer and clearer that we have um, a number of global actors um, struggling to give a certain shape to the global system. Um, I think if we think back to the decade from 2000 to 2010, this was the return of a certain universalism in global politics. Really the moment when the idea of Westphalia, that you have different political orders, irreconcilable in the end, but living in peace with each other, at least this is the initial proposition, this idea is um, more and more being abandoned. And what you have now, in my opinion, is a number of projects for the global order as a whole. I think the Iraq war in the United States was the moment when you saw the United States fully embrace its already existing universalism, but in a much more ambitious and open way. Then we have um, 2007, 2009, the Con Lisbon Treaty, uh, a new foreign policy, much more ambitious, uh, a neighborhood policy, so the EU embraces its role of also shaping the global system. And then we have 2008 and the Georgia war where Russia also uh, declares its strategic goal of being a global player and shaping a new global order and a different global order. So that decade was uh, the end of, um, of, of national politics, really the beginning of a new, much more universalistic geopolitics and the EU has to be ready for this the stronger EU foreign policy uh, uh, machinery. More creative and innovative, as Pierre <coughs> Vimont has said, and more flexible. Now, let me very, very briefly go over some of the ideas uh, from, uh, from our Lisbon meeting, which follow from these initial presuppositions. Uh, we were concerned, first of all, with the question of uh, forecasting and scenario outlook the sense that uh, this needs to be improved, the sense that came out of Vilnius that uh, forecasting at the EU level was not good enough, and how should we deal with that? It's very difficult, and uh, lots of voices in our Lisbon meeting pointed out that it's impossible to predict the future, but that is not the point. The point is to have a number of scenarios and think about what consequences follow from each of them, to have a tree of decision and, and different outcomes, and how that can be done. Um, the paper points out that one thing we could do would be to formalize the process of forecasting so that it can be more self-critical. Uh, we have, of course, in the Foreign Affairs Council, many ministers evaluating 
uh, future developments and doing scenario outlook. But this process is not fully formalized in the sense that we can then look back and see where we were right, where we were wrong, and try to improve it. I think the EU, uh, U.S. foreign policy machinery is better with, on this with the national intelligence estimates, which are permanently being evaluated. Um, and, uh, and we should perhaps look at uh, ways to formalize and institutionalize this forecasting exercise. Second, how to link EU foreign policy and national foreign policy. Pierre Vimon has talked already about this. Uh, I very much like this idea of flexibility, having groups of member states work together to bridge this enormous distance between national capitals and the, and the 28 as a whole in the Foreign Affairs Council. There should be intermediate bodies to bridge this distance. Uh, to make it more executive, since with 28 it's difficult to have an executive body, and we have something more like a Senate than, a, than an executive body. Pierre Vimon mentioned that there should be a representative from the EU there, and this is, of course, uh, also what we think. Um, uh, I'm also concerned that these groups should be, uh, should be variable. One would have different groups for different briefs and different issues. Perhaps having a country that is directly uh, related and connected to the issue at hand, having a country that is a bit more distant, having smaller countries and bigger countries. But this idea of the old idea of a troika of foreign ministers is perhaps something worth, worth going back to in a more, uh, in a more informal way. Uh, then uh, we talked a bit about um, what kind of tools we have and how to make them uh, faster. Uh, how to make them uh, better able to react to unpredictable situations and better able to um, execute uh, EU foreign policy goals. The executive dimension is lacking. Uh, EU foreign policy is administrative uh, in its nature uh, and regulatory. Uh, <laughs> we don't have the, the flexibility, the discretion of an, of an executive decision. Uh, and this, is, this lack is very clear when we compare EU foreign policy to American foreign policy, Chinese foreign policy, or Russian foreign policy. How to do this without breaking with our, uh, with our um, political and institutional tradition is also talked about in this, uh, in this paper. Uh, one or two final points. The European Council, so we've now become uh, much more clear that the European Council is where the big decisions are going to be made. Well, let's accept that, but let's try to make the European Council a body that can also prepare the future, a more strategic body that can plan ahead. Let's try to, if we accept that the European Council is where the big decisions are made, let's try not to turn them all into emergency last-minute decisions. I actually think this has been happening already under President Tusk. We have a number of cases where the European Council has been deciding well ahead, planning the Riga summit. It's not a surprise that the Riga summit, some people think it was disappointing, but it was well prepared, expectations were well managed. We got what we wanted out of it. Um, TTIP, the European Council has been involved in this, not because it is a crisis issue, but because it is an important issue. And Russia sanctions, which were dealt fundamentally with uh, already in the March European Council uh, and not the June European Council. So good examples of how you deal with difficult issues well ahead of, uh, of uh, the time when they finally have to be decided. And, and finally, to conclude, there's a number of, uh, of recommendations and suggestions about both the external structure and the internal structure of EU foreign policy. I think this is an interesting distinction. The internal structure has to do how to organize foreign policy from within with all the institutions and bodies that we have, how to make them stronger. We're particularly interested in discussing the political and security committee and how to upgrade it. Uh, but also the external structure in the sense that uh, we have a much more global, holistic approach to these issues now. Uh, and EU foreign policy has to be able to relate to uh, uh, international organizations like the uh, International Monetary Fund um, uh, like the European Investment Bank, uh, like the World Trade Organization. Uh, EU, for, EU foreign policy shouldn't be a, 
uh, closed silo. It should be open to other issues which are not traditionally foreign policy, but which are becoming more and more difficult to bluntly distinguish from foreign policy. And we also discuss ways in which this could be done. One sentence to conclude. Um, the idea of this paper and the Lisbon discussion was to talk about how foreign policy should be conducted. Not what foreign policy we should have, but how we should conduct it, conduct it uh, whatever it is, whatever it turns out to be. Uh, I think this is an important idea to keep in mind. I'm always reminded of the old Kantian recommendation. Before we start to think, it would be good to think about how we should think. Uh, otherwise, we'll be thinking badly without even knowing it. So let's start by using the resources available to us to create a better system and a better machinery. And then we'll use the system and the machinery. But to jump immediately to the, to the content without thinking about the form is, is not the best uh, way of thinking and it's also not, not the best way to do foreign policy. This is the, the basic idea of, uh, of our Lisbon meeting and of the paper that came out of it. Bruno, let me also ask you a quick follow-up. <clears throat> One of the points you make in the paper is that um, most of the foreign policy tools that the EU has are non-Machiavellian tools, meaning that they're not coercive in nature, but that they depend on the other side um, you know, to have goodwill and to actually play along and also you know, basically share um, the idea behind it. So the coercion is not really the EU's strong side. Now, with, with all of that time that has passed since the workshop and with some of the things, especially about the executive nature of all of this in mind, how can we work around this? We will not be a coercive power anytime soon. How important is that really? Is that a structural flaw that we can't work around or is this something that we can compensate in other ways? Mm -hmm. This was talked a lot about in Lisbon. Uh, the paper tries to uh, subtly uh, give some order to the discussion we had in Lisbon. These are the different possibilities that, that I see to deal with that question. Of course, we could try to develop pure Machiavellian tools all the way up to a European army. Uh, we all know that is going to be difficult for the time being. Uh, we could give up the idea of having uh, any Machiavellian tools, turn the EU into uh, a pure soft power uh, global actor, um, using its uh, deep pockets to influence uh, decisions and processes in the directions that it wants. I think we should try to look for something in between these two options. Uh, because we do have tools that are not reliant on the willingness of the other side to play along, as you have pointed out many times. Uh, we do have a trade policy, we do have a competition policy, uh, economic sanctions. Uh, the problem, uh, I think, with these tools is that they are not flexible enough, uh, or they were not flexible enough, scalable enough, malleable enough, I think the story from the last two years is actually an attempt to turn economic sanctions into a tool that is both Machiavellian in that sense, the other side can do, can do nothing about it, but a lot more uh, flexible. Uh, and there was a lot of effort to, to make the sanctions uh, almost surgical, entirely scale, scalable, sanctions that could be easily removed or increased, uh, and this I think uh, with all the constraints that we have is the best approach and this could be further developed. Uh, so what Machiavellian instruments we should have, we should use them better and give them the institutional structure to use them better in a much more flexible, quicker, faster, but also scalable way. Uh, uh, this to me seems the most promising way to solve this problem, which is a real problem and is going to stay with us. Because the other two alternatives um, are not satisfying in the end. Thank you, Bruno. Sylvie, lots of material to talk about <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, and perhaps to comment on, but I'm sure you have your, your own points as well. Um, uh, just a, a one little side note. It was our goal to make this room warmer than the outside, which after the last couple of days was a bit of a challenge, actually. But we, with your help, we succeeded to turn this room into a sauna again, which we <laughs> always do at Carnegie. But now we've opened the doors. If this is too much of a draft, let us know. But I think it's getting a little better, right? It was a bit warm. Um, and we always apologize for this. But you know, if somebody has a good idea for fundraising for climate control in this building, <laughs> please approach me afterwards. Sylvie. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I have the, the double inconvenient or advantage of uh, being of not being a Brussels insider and not being a policymaker. So I, I can bring the irresponsible views and the, 
layman view or the contrarian view. Um, and listening and reading your uh, excellent uh, papers and, and uh, listening to these very sophisticated views about uh, all the tools and the challenges of EU foreign policy <coughs> reminded me of the, the motto of the uh, Clinton campaign, Bill Clinton campaign, it's the economy stupid. I think in this field it's, it's the politics stupid. And uh, whatever uh, is being thought and built here in Brussels, there's one bottom line that you cannot really avoid, is that when all these leaders go back home, um, they are facing their voters. And um, uh, this is something that, uh, you know, we cannot forget that at the end of the day, there are public opinions there. I mean, we are very much uh, witnessing this uh, these days on other issues. But um, uh, I think one, um, one tool, when Pierre uh, talks about the comprehensive, the necessity of a comprehensive political vision, there's another word which, uh, which um, goes along with this, which is a very fashionable word now. It's uh, a narrative. Uh, I think we really badly need a narrative. Uh, China has a narrative, uh, America has a narrative. I think we haven't really found our um, European narrative for, the for, for our foreign policy. And that would be a narrative that leaders, whoever they are, you know, in those 28 countries can go back home and build on. And that also the, the high representative can also spread around when she travels um, or when she speaks out. So there is the, 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 the weapon or the tool of the bully pulpit. Uh, I think Catherine Ashton had, uh, hadn't uh, <laughs> used it very much. Uh, Mogherini uh, does use it more. But still, I mean, you may have a bully <coughs> pulpit. You still need to say something from the bully pulpit. So um, I think this is really something um, which is very political. You know, if you have this narrative, it has to be very political to, to convince public opinions. And public opinions, which of course have totally divergent interests or, or, or diver, divergent concerns. Um, I think one of the, of the powerful cases which uh, uh, powerful cases that can be made and that you are making in, in, in a way is that we are much stronger united than uh, the sum of individuals. So, um, and this is something which still doesn't, um, is not understood, I think, in, in national uh, public opinions. It's uh, that the, the, the strength, the power of, of the union, if it acts, if, they, if, if the member states act together and have you know, this, this common narrative is, um, hasn't come through yet, I think. And it's, it's, it's a case which still has to be made in political uh, terms. Um, for instance, the neighborhood, uh, the neighborhood policy. I mean, what does na a neighborhood policy mean to, to public opinions? It's far too abstract, it's far too vague. Um, so, uh, it's 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 uh, it's very Brussels-like in a way. It's uh, you know uh, it's very well understood here, but beyond Brussels, um, we don't have a, a word for beyond the Beltway, which applies to Brussels. No, uh, but this is what I mean. It's uh, it's uh, it's um, very difficult to apprehend for for voters. Um, you know this one size fits all concept is 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 just it doesn't play. Uh, why? should Turkey, Ukraine, Moldova, um, or, or, or Tunisia uh, be applied the same concept. It's, it's, just, uh, it, it's just very difficult to understand. So in these neighborhood uh, policies, which of course are indispensable, we need to have uh, policies. I think we should, uh, one, one good way of building a narrative is also would also be to choose some priorities. And I think we have two priorities at the moment, which are Ukraine and Tunisia, and which are, of course, very different uh, 
cases. Uh, you cannot apply the same recipes to, of course, the two of them. Um, but these, I'm very struck by the fact that if you are in Poland, people are not interested in Tunisia beyond the, the touristic uh, aspect. Um, and, uh, and in the south of Europe, of course, we are far less interested in, in, in Ukraine. I mean, that sounds like a tautology, uh, but it's a fact that you have to take into account. And uh, at the same time, um, you can see about the migrant crisis, the huge differences of perception that we have across Europe. Uh, and uh, also about terrorism issues. Uh, yet the case can really be made that this affects all of us, including, you know, even, even though the, the migrants are coming through the Mediterranean at the moment, and we were talking about this just before coming in, of course, the routes are being modified and they, will, they are already coming through other routes and land routes and so on. It's uh, now it's affecting Hungary. So you know, I think Poland can very uh, the Poles should uh, uh, be open and can be um, convinced that it is something which also uh, is important to them and that they have to to be uh, involved in uh, when the time comes to find a solution. Um, you know, among, I think there are other issues that we can build a narrative on. It's China, for instance. China, uh, it's, it sounds, it's, it's quite obvious that um, Europe, the European Union, when you're faced with China, is much more, can be much more efficient if it's one rather than, you know, individual countries. Uh, um, going to Beijing and playing their individual cards, of course, you cannot uh, prevent commercial interest uh, from coming um, in the middle of this and from being, um, I mean, you won't, you won't prevent uh, countries to, to play this card also. But beyond this, I think there is really a case which can be made uh, for Europe uh, regarding China. We have here, uh, we're dealing with a partner which um, uh, has a major role on the global scene, which uh, doesn't share our values, uh, um, which uh, is creating a lot of tensions in East and, and Southeast Asia. Uh, there are enormous security and, in, and economic interests at stake, and the European Union as such um, uh, has a role to play also. Um, we were talking about tools. Um, solidarity, you know, we have to find a way to build on, to, to, to translate this principle of solidarity into actions. And this has been so obvious on the, on the migration crisis. Uh, this has been so obvious on the terrorism <laughs> issue. And, and Talking about Machiavellian tools, of course, uh, Bruno, you are absolutely right to say that uh, the idea of European army is, is, is difficult and it's quite far away. But still, um, if we don't have, if we are not able to act better when we have to be militarily involved, how can you have a foreign, you know, a, a, a sensible, uh, discourse on foreign policy, on the common foreign policy. We have had these examples of uh, um, uh, operations in uh, Central African Republic and in Mali where, you know, one member state in particular was ready to act and uh, you have this, what you call, uh, these conferences where you talk about um, means, generation, force, and we have the conference of generation, force. I don't know in English, but, um, and you know, you ask for help and everybody's looking, staring at his shoes and, uh, and help is not coming. Um, I think we have to do better than that. Uh, and some member states have to understand that solidarity is a two-way lane. 
Um, and I think this is something which can be understood by and explained to public opinions. Um, I think this lack of common defense efforts, I'm not talking about an army, but of, of uh, um, capacity to come together on a particular operation which is in the interest of all of us, uh, is an existential problem for, for, for the European Union and for our European foreign policy. Uh, last uh, point, um, diversity. I think diversity is, um, and it goes to the point you've both made about flexibility, which I think is a very, very important point. Uh, diversity is both a strength and a weakness uh, in many respects, but including in the European Union. Um, it's a weakness if, if, we, if we let it, if we if it plays uh, against each other, and it's a strength, of course, if we come together. Um, I, I, I was struck recently, I was part of a study, tru uh, study trip to Bielorussia with the European Council on Foreign Relations, and we had a, a fantastic dinner with the, the EU ambassadors there. And of course, there was the, the, represent the, the ambassador representing the European Commission, uh, who was from Latvia, and there were, I think, a dozen of uh, other EU of, of EU member states uh, ambassadors. And listening to them, I was really struck by the the wealth of the, the that they brought that each of them brought with his or her own uh, identity, uh, his or her own history. Um, you know all. That what what the, the national perception or expertise brought to this uh, issue, to the common issue, and I think you know if we had this uh, conversation with an American ambassador, of course we would only have one view, um, and those views, of course, were absolutely not contradictory. They were all um, fairly. Um, uh, getting to the same point, but bringing very different um, uh, points and, uh, and, and, and expertise. And I thought, you know, this is really, this is where the European diversity is at its best, when it, uh, when it helps uh, to, when it um, <laughs> enriches the, the, the views and the expertise. So I think the, the, probably the high representative should tap into this resource in a more concrete way. Uh, the idea of small working groups um, bringing together uh, ministers or, or officials from countries which have a dog in the fight of, of, of the issue concerned, but also uh, representatives of countries which don't have a dog in the fight and which will have, which will bring uh, maybe contradictory views or paradoxical views. This is really something which I think would be a, a, a very good tool. Um, the the format of the Iranian negotiations, I think, is a, is a format that we can also uh, take inspiration for from. Um, but you know, for instance, and another example, I think on the on the Eastern Partnership, uh, we had two brilliant people uh, working on this: uh, Karl Bildt and, and Radek Sikorsky, and they were probably the best um, um, people we could think to 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 work on this. But maybe it would have been good to have somebody also totally external to this issue, who was not so knowledgeable and involved as they were. Um, so maybe this is also an experience we can draw from, and I will stop there. You will stop there. I'd like to ask you all to get your questions ready, um, but before um, I, I give it to the audience, Sylvia, a quick question to you. You said in the very beginning a very simple thing, but which is a fundamental thing, which is that the idea that we are actually stronger together doesn't seem really to register in this field. It's a very simple thing to say, but it's an enormous problem. I mean, something that seems to work in the single market, seems to work on something like maybe you know, police cooperation, and even on the currency to a certain extent, doesn't seem to really register in this field. Now, political scientists will always say, well, it's a matter of national interest, and they diverge, and so naturally it's not that easy. But what's your take? Why doesn't the simple truth 
doesn't register better? Is it an elite problem? Is it a population problem? Where's, 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 where's the issue here? I think it's very much an elite problem, and in this I include the media, <laughs> of course, but uh, I think the political establishment and the media have a very hard time uh, explaining to the public that um, uh, that the, the, the migrant crisis, for instance, doesn't only affect the countries where, which are, where, where, where the migrants uh, uh, arrive. Um, or, or that Russia, you know, it may be far from uh, the south of France or Portugal, but uh, you, the, Korean, the Ukrainian issues affects us all. It's, it's, it's a case we, we which is difficult to make, but I think it's a lack of uh, of courage, of course. And um, you, you see, for instance, we had uh, recently I'm, Le Monde. My, my paper works uh, with five other newspapers, European newspapers, uh, in, a, in a project called Europa, and it's an, irreg an irregular collaboration. But we use it more and more on, on now on short. Uh, um, short-term issues, like for instance, we had uh, we did two pa two or three pages uh, together a week ago about uh, the migrant crisis. So uh, each of us contributes one piece to an issue um, that we choose, and we asked the uh, journalist from Gazeta Wyborcza, the Polish paper, to write about why the Poles uh, having almost no immigrants, except from some, some Ukrainians, uh, are so reluctant to um, accept quotas or you know, um, refugees. Or, and I must say this issue was not, from what I hear, was not so well addressed in the Polish press. The piece he wrote for, and which was published in, in, in the five other European newspapers, including The Guardian, of course, had a huge echo in, in the UK, but also in, in Germany, in the Süddeutsche Zeitung, and in, in Le Monde. And, um, and so it reverberated back in Poland. And uh, you see, I think that's quite interesting, because sometimes you have to go through other countries to talk back to your own country. And that shows that we really, to me, it's a sign. It's a bit complicated to, to, to do concretely every day, if you want. But I think it's a message to media and to politicians that together we can, we can uh, work more on, on, on these issues, mm -hmm. which uh, are not so obvious at the beginning. All right, great. Um, thanks to all of you for the, for the input, which was very rich and very diverse, and now I'd like to open it up. I think the first question is here in the first row, and then the fingers are going up. This is great. Giovanni, and then the gentleman behind Giovanni, and then Mark. I take those four first, and then I'm moving over to this side. Please. Uh, thank you, um, Catherine Muller. Two short questions. Um, Mr. Vimon, I very much enjoyed your paper, and you set out a lot of clear recommendations. My question is, who needs to be convinced in order for that, your vision to happen, and how will you convince them? And the second question is a broader one about the future of diplomacy, and hearing again this discussion of trade, and the fact that the EU's power, as we know, lies uh, largely in its trade policy. Generally, how can diplomats reassert themselves in this relationship with commercial and corporate interests? We certainly see at national level diplomacy and the idea of commercial diplomacy has rendered diplomats often the servants of commercial interests. At EU level, there's a different problem, which is DG trade, and it's unwillingness to allow EU trade policy to be used as a foreign policy tool. And so I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on how that can be uh, instrumentalized. Excellent, Giovanni Grevi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for very interesting presentations and uh, very good papers. I'm Giovanni Grevi with Friede. Um, I very much agree that uh, at the end of the day is the politics. Um, and uh, in fact, perhaps one element which is common to the debate on internal policies, to debate cut and cross internal and external such as migration, and to debate on foreign policy is that somehow paradoxically, the more we have adopted treaties, reforms, rules, the more we have to some extent improved the potential for governance, the more the politics have fragmented. 
across the European Union. And this is a paradox that I think is core to our reflection and our debate. But my question really goes to the question of the vision, the narrative, as it has been uh, put in the debate and in the papers. The European Union, up to a few years ago, one could say had at least a narrative. Whether or not that corresponded to facts or not, we can discuss, but had a narrative, could be said, effective multilateralism, um, ring of uh, well-governed states, actually the neighborhood policy, but essentially transforming part of the neighborhood in ways, and soft power, and so on and so forth. Now, that narrative has to be updated, we know. What would be your one element uh, that you would suggest for this, uh, at least in part, new narrative that makes it appealing, internally and externally, distinctive, and I would add, realistic, meaning we are speaking of the European Union, which is not a global actor or an international actor like others, and the question is how can we adjust the need for the narrative to the particular features of this particular political body that is the European Union in the world. Thank you. Thanks, Giovanni. Right behind you, take two more, and then Mark after this, okay. and then we go uh, on. Thank you. My name is Mark Franco. I'm a former official of the European institutions and we know each other. Uh, my first question uh, is related to the question that was asked already by the lady, and it's about the concept of interest. Uh, Mr. Vimont, you spoke about uh, value added of the uh, European foreign policy. Uh, aren't we totally, uh, uh, I, would, I would say, incapable or possibly uh, uh, unwilling to define what our interests are? We are very good in talking about all the good we want to do for the world. It's development, it's peace, international law, democracy, human rights, and the list is very long. But then in the end, why do we do it? I mean, foreign policy is also about interests, and we are incapable of defining what European interests are uh, in order to balance uh, what the values are with what the interests are. I mean, uh, uh, it, it, in, in, in my experience, uh, when I went to a ministry uh, of foreign affairs to do a demarche on one of the other human rights issues, uh, I was listened to with more or less uh, politeness. Uh, but my successor uh, very often was an ambassador from a member state who said, we want to come and help you with the construction of your metro, or we want to do some more exploration on gas in your sea. Uh, so how do you balance the two? You have a, the European message, and then you have the member states' measures, you have the value and the interest. The second question uh, is about uh, a sentence, sorry, in your text, where you talk about uh, lack of realistic touch, uh, and you say uh, that the appetite for action compared with its capabilities and overambition objectives that are not matched by sufficient means. Uh, what you say is also applies at this moment to neighborhood policy where we negotiate and sign with countries agreements that, if you look at them, in fact are a roadmap for what I would call a soft power regime change, but we can't offer an institutional perspective, we can't offer the necessary means to do it, uh, we can't offer the security or the defense protection or cooperation that you would need. Uh, would that, uh, what would be the implication for a new uh, neighborhood policy? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, at the uh, Egmont Institute. Uh, two comments. One about, about this. We should not sort of indulge into chest beating. Uh, there have been successes in EU foreign policy. There's no precedent for that. There's no model to follow. So uh, as long as uh, we are pioneer of the European states, are pioneers in, in that respect, uh, I think we learn by doing. And, 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 and we should not underestimate the successes and maybe in, in looking at reforms that are, or, or improvement that are necessary, look at the successes. Why did we succeed? I mean, I think, for instance, in the Horn of Africa, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the Red Sea, uh, or in the, in, uh, um, in Somalia, uh, the EU has made a difference. There is, uh, uh, if in, in many places in the Sahel, if the EU was not there with some of its policies of crisis management missions, development, uh, it would be worse. That is, uh, uh, so I think uh, we should not indulge in too much uh, uh, um, guilty feelings. Uh, 
what what could be done is uh, in, in 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 looking at reform. Then is maybe uh, uh, go away from the Brussels habit to make sure that it works in theory before it works in practice, and and and, and reverse the terms. Uh, let's look at what works and draw the consequences of that. So, I think the issue of flexibility. Uh, that's my second comment that Pierre uh, raised. is very important. Uh, and there also, it already hap it's already happening. Uh, 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 Sylvie made, uh, gave the example of Iran. It, it does uh, already happen that a group of member states decide to do things, uh, but they're looking uh, always for European legitimacy. When Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Hollande go to Minsk, they don't report to their parliament, they report to the European Council. They need the European legitimacy for what they do, so I think uh, that's, that's uh, already happening. And when it comes to tools, yes, I think more flexibility should be uh, at the order of the day in view of the nature of the what is the object of foreign policy. You don't deal with Ebola, an Ebola crisis the way we deal, you deal with a, 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 a traditional border crisis between two, two countries. So this flexibility uh, must come not only from inside the institutions but from member states. The, the EAS should, and the high representative should have at our disposal the means that are present in the, in the member states. And there should be a sort of a, a, a more, an acceptance that uh, for some crises you have one structure dealing with it and, and, and you recreate another structure for another crisis. And then when you don't have it in your house, you ask member states to provide them. I think uh, the idea of a sort of standby capabilities that are pre is present in, in, in the member states should be uh, worked on. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'd like to give all of you the chance to um, give answers to these questions. And then we have enough time for a second round. And uh, I don't know, Pierre, you want to perhaps start and pick some of these things? Some of these things. Uh, I'll be very quick. Um, th the first question, is who must be convinced? <laughs> I, I personally, I totally agree with you. What is surprising, and every time you talk about everything we have been talking with individuals inside the system, they all agree. Yeah. How come then that the system doesn't really um, uh, deliver what we're all looking at? I think because you have a little bit like... Um, like Sylvie was saying about politics, is that you have to start at the, stop, at the top. Mm -hmm. It needs to be a, a top-down process. Uh, and if you don't get that, and to some extent, I, I still think that was maybe one of the problems of the Lisbon Treaty. You know, Once this had been negotiated, agreed, uh, nobody knew exactly how to use this, uh, this whole thing. <laughs> and there wasn't, from top-down to the whole system, uh, clear instructions or whatever, I don't know how, how we should call that, uh, but, uh, you know, strong, uh, strong recommendation that we should move ahead and, and, and work in, in the proper way. And I think apart from foreign policy, this is something that is missing quite often in our, our system. From, from our political leaders, clear indication that they are all committed to Europe and, and to what they have just adopted and that we should push it. Uh, and, and I think this is one of, of the problems that we, we're, we're facing. You, you were asking about diplomats um, and uh, um, what is their role and how do they find a role compared with business community, uh, TTIP whatsoever, DG Trade and so on and so forth. I think diplomats from many years, 19th century and so on, had to do with politics here again. And they have lost this a little bit, you know. They have thought that they had to compete with experts from transport, from energy whatsoever. They can't. So that is, but they have to bring a real, real added value, which is to understand the world we're living in and what's happening at the moment. Uh, because when you go and try to negotiate a trade, a trade agreement, with a country that you don't know about the politics, you can get lost very quickly. Yeah. And this is where diplomats should be both more humbled and at the same time more assertive in, in giving precisely recommendations. And others should listen a little bit more to them. You know. The problem with diplomats is uh, because of their, uh, their tradition, their reputation, they look a little bit like an, an, uh, a nuisance when they, <laughs> then they pop in. And I know that some of my colleagues from uh, from many DGs in the Commission, look at the ES in that way. You know, here they come with politics again. We don't need them, and I think 
once we all can understand that this can bring added value, I think it would change a lot. And maybe sometimes we ourselves are not very, very, very good at this. Uh, very briefly, just two other points, because I'm sure more will be said about this. Uh, the narrative. For me, it's honestly, it's still the same as, as the beginning. We only have to update it. Listen, peace and prosperity. What better narrative can you have today about peace, which is, you know, about how are we going to push back the whole terrorist moves um, and uh, initiatives that are taking place around us? As for prosperity, is about how is Europe going to find again prosperity? You know, what kind of growth will we be able to push forward? And I think on, on these two things, we're much better doing it together. Um, and if we were able to convince everyone that this is really what it's about, which was really what it was all about at the beginning, it would be much more, m much more useful. On the last two points, I uh, have not much to, to add. To Mark, I, Mark Ott, um, I totally agree with the fact that we shouldn't be too much self-deprecating. Um, um, but at the same time, we should not indulge also. You know, it's finding the right balance. Uh, there is still a very long road on which we, we need to, to make progress. And I would very much agree with what you were saying about the need to, to use lessons learned and what Bruno was saying about uh, better have a sort of permanent review of what we have done and how to improve it. I think that would be, um, that would be very useful. As for Marc Franco, about the added value and the interest, um, to think more sometimes about interest and less about uh, values, here again, it's a mixture of both and it's to find the right balance. But I think sometimes, and we have been going through very difficult, um, um, very difficult debates in, in the Council recently about Egypt. What should we do with Egypt? Mm -hmm. With Ukraine? What should we do with our relationship with, uh, with Russia? And we have been agonizing about this without finding, up to now, a sort of common line. I think these are issues that we need to face uh, in a much more courageous way and not, you know, just uh, if we can't agree, say we'll come back to it again because we're pretty much divided. I think it's very important to be able to go to the heart of these issues and try to find a way through. Bruno, you want to pick a few? Two, two or three quick comments. Um, the, the, the EU foreign policy machinery, to me, a relative outsider, uh, looks a bit loose. Uh, you need to tighten the screws a little bit. The world has an enormous amount of constraints. Our foreign policy is a bit loose, uh, a bit, uh, still a bit unpredictable, still a bit unfocused. Um, and so I don't think either myself or Pierre Vimont are suggesting big, a big revolution or big revolutionary changes. But you have to look at the machinery with focus and improve it where it needs to be improved. Um, I'm also not, and I'm perhaps Pierre agrees with me on this. I'm not one of those who thinks that it's all about the mentality, it's all about the spirit, it's all about the ideas, uh, and that if we can have a, a, a big collective decision to embrace Europe and to embrace European foreign policy, everything will be solved. Uh, many times it's about the institutional design, and this is what makes problems either worse or reduces them, uh, identifies and explores opportunities, you know, think back to the Federalist Papers in the United States. It's the best example of that. You have human nature, and it is what it is. But then you have a really concerted effort to come up with the best machinery, to do institutional design at a very high level. Um, and, and the European Union should be able to do this. Uh, of course, there's rivalry between states. Of course, different public opinions create a big problem. Uh, you have, this is the, the in, in fact, the. Uh, the main paradox of European politics. You have 28 heads of government who have to come together and reach a common decision, but they all also have to follow their own public opinions, and they are completely separate, with very little connecting <coughs> channels between them. Okay, we know this problem is there, but then we can either create the right kind of institutional structure and institutional design to alleviate the problem and to explore opportunities that it actually offers, or we can have the wrong kind of institutional design, which just exacerbates the problem even more. Bruno, can I come in here? I would like to ask a quick question on this. Um, on the Ukraine crisis and on Iran, let's take those two. Perhaps you can even make the case that in Kosovo, Serbia, 
These were all relative successes, really big important issues of overriding importance, um, a pretty unified you know, interest uh, situation in, within the EU and a strong mandate given by the member states to the institutions. In those cases, the machinery can work. And in those cases, we even step beyond the boundaries of the machinery and create foreign policy results. So is this a case where we just need enough pain you know, and then miraculously, you know, we can get it done. And on all of the other things, you know, pain is not big enough, and so it takes two months to get a reply to a, you know, a diplomatic snub by North Korea. And so the, the, the question is, is this a cynical kind of, you know, pain threshold kind of argument, um, or can we structurally improve this? Because human nature, you know, you just mentioned the Federalist Papers, it is as it is, you can also apply this to Europe and say, well, as long as the pain is not big enough, well, there's not going to be unity. I think this is what I mean by, by that metaphor of, a, of, lo of loose machinery. Sometimes it works, sometimes it works very well. First of all, it needs an extraordinary amount of political attention and political work, which kind of reveals to me that the machinery is not working at its best. It only works at its best if everyone is simultaneously focused on the problem. Uh, which we saw in the case of Ukraine, and I think there's some good decisions taken over the last year or two. Um, but again, under enormous pressure and enormous political concentration, the level of effort that is necessary to come up with uh, good insights and good decisions is overbearing, and you're going to make many mistakes. And I, I tend to think that in foreign policy, uh, you may be right 99% of the times, but if you make a really big mistake, um, that's enough for, for the consequences to be devastating. Um, and I have to say very openly that the EU foreign policy machinery does not at present uh, give us the confidence that it will be able to be consistently good over all the challenges that are going to appear over the next 10 years. Uh, although in many instances it is going to be very, very good. I think that's the case. I think the case of Kosovo is, is an obvious one of a very, very difficult problem. Uh, but do we think that the machinery worked in the case of Kosovo because it is bound to work? Or do we think that there were a number of contingent elements and the extraordinary work that uh, the former high representative did uh, in that particular case and other contingent factors, uh, but that um, we, we don't have the confidence that it will always work well? Mm. So you want to pick something real um, quick so that we have a chance yes, for us? Yes, um, on the narrative and, and, and the definition of our interest quickly. Um, we're, we're extremely bad at PR, but I don't think that's a surprise to, <laughs> to any of you. I, I, I was thinking of the beginning of the Ukraine, of, you know, of the Ukrainian episode, this one, uh, and Maidan, and those uh, EU flags for days and days being you know, um, uh, uh, flashed on, on, on the square. And we haven't built on this. We could have done. I mean, this is really a very powerful argument that, that, the, that the European Union ideal is so ideal and reality is so attractive. Um, you know, we haven't built on, on this at all uh, in terms of uh, Narrative. I hate that word, but it uh, always comes back uh, somehow. But uh, in, in terms of, of uh, public relations also, we should, I think, we, we made a mistake there. And also, if you look at it uh, on the Greek um, story also, it's very interesting to see Eurosceptic movements uh, suddenly panicking that the Greeks may leave the Eurozone. You know, it's totally contradictory, but that shows also the power of of uh, of the European idea, you know, you're against it. But if a member says, uh, if a member may may get may get out of it, it's a tragedy. So this is also, th I think, something we could we could uh, work on. How how this idea has, in fact, is so now ingrained in the public mind that you know. The, the sheer idea of living outside of it is difficult to, to apprehend. I'd like to get, we have about 10 minutes um, before we have to get the wine out, obviously. Um, so this gentleman with the green sweater in the front row, and then, of course, uh, uh, these two, and then a third one here, and I think we start over here. <laughs> uh, 
still is a very good afternoon to all the speakers. Uh, thank you for for your very valuable contributions. My name is José Guimarães, Youth Proactive. Uh, I have a question for very good, two quick questions. One for Pierre, another one for Bruno. Uh, for Pierre, um, I think you make very very good points here when you refer to the use and define added value. Uh, I would like to make here uh, a further point. I think something that also needs to be addressed is what is the undefined value, added value, of the individual member states uh, to the EU foreign policy. Uh, we cannot simply sleepwalk uh, into European construction, and I think not only in the European policy, but uh, definitely in this case, it will help a lot um, also from a um, from a civilian perspective of uh, EU building menta mentality to if they understand what can they bring different. In EU foreign policy, you have, well, in the EU you have 28 member states in, from different geographies, from different, with different geopolitical uh, realities, with different historical perspectives, with different alliances present in the historical, with very, very different countries. If the EU somehow managed to bring together, and they say, each and every one of you can bring to our EU foreign policy an added value and strength. Of course, uh, Brussels can be uh, at will. No one's going to say uh, anything against it. But if uh, the member states, member states feel involved in this, maybe it will be also a bit easier for them to move a bit more um, of their competences, a bit of their sovereignty, uh, sovereignty if you want, to the supranational level. Uh, to Bruno, uh, I would only have um, a very simple question. It was uh, already mentioned, I believe, by Pierre uh, that the EU neighbor neighborhood policy uh, is a fire. I think we can say uh, out loud, considering all the challenges we have in our neighborhood in Africa, uh, the, the ISIS, everything, uh, Europe is a war. I think it has been said out loud by many people, but I think we can say, unfortunately, we are at war. Uh, in present day, uh, most of our attention has been driven because of a very pressing issue uh, referring, involving one member state which needs not to be mentioned. Uh, okay. But the truth is, even if by magic arts that problem disappeared, everything was okay with that member state and our relationship with it, we will still be can uh, I, can surrounded. Can I ask you to ask that question yes, because yes. we are a bit on the time yes. constraints? Uh, even if that disappeared, we would still be surrounded by problems, each and every one of them sufficient to endanger the EU cohesion and very existence, uh, in the, even at, at, sh at the short term. I would like to, uh, to ask you, uh, from your uh, very privileged position, if you believe, you already mentioned that the EU machinery sometimes doesn't work as well as it should, but do you feel uh, that there is an understanding uh, at a high level of this reality? And if so, do you feel there is a feeling of common challenge or uh, the feeling of entrenchment is stronger? Thank you. Thank you very much. Ambassador von der Möllebecke, here, it's, it's right there. Uh, thank you. On the uh, issue of speaking with one voice, um, Russia speaking with one voice, United States speaking with one voice, Europe has a great difficulty because of the consensus rule. Um, what would it take to, in order to amend this consensus rule to make this a priority? for the EU. I heard the word by the French journalist and I like it very much. What would it take to move it to a priority and not a side issue as it has been for the last 20 years? Uh, it would make uh, uh, or it has made uh, Europe uh, uh, so far a not so serious contender if com in comparison with the other players and uh, um, Europe could enjoy greatly by Taking, making it a priority and not a side issue any longer. Thank you very much. And Stephen Blockmans with a final question. One comment, one, uh, one question. Um, there was a lot of focus on institutional innovation, uh, the framework, the mechanisms which would ought to be um, improved. Um, this, ve the same very, uh, this, this very same narrative could apply to you know, the, the type of overreaction which we've seen lately on the side of uh, the EU in cobbling together in a boat sinking operation off the coast of Libya, EU Nafor Med, which um, came surprisingly quickly to uh, a conclusion in the Council uh, with a decision 
on, on launching this operation without the very same machinery that you've talked about from a negative perspective, essentially, um, having provided enough uh, barriers, perhaps, to prevent the EU from launching a mission that in phases two and three lacks a mandate. Um, my question, however, relates to the philosophy of a more assertive mindset for EU foreign policy. Would, if I understand correctly, Pierre Vimont is saying that um, we essentially have the narrative, we ought to tweak it. We have a, a narrative of uh, peace and prosperity. But in this more assertive mindset, would you go as far as to say that the EU would, be, uh, would have to go to war in order to safeguard its interest? All right, the big one for, as the last one. Um, we do it in the reverse order this time, so Sylvia, I'd like to ask you to comment first, and then we give yeah. Pierre the, the final word. Well, if peace is threatened, I guess you have to be able to make the case that you have to go to war, yes. Um, you know, I mean, we, we're faced with very serious um, issues in the south of the Mediterranean, uh, in Syria and, and ISIS and, you know, and it's not only on the other side of the Mediterranean as we have seen, it's uh, many places of, of Europe now. So, you know, I think, yes, this is an issue which people think about. I mean, it's not only in Brussels, I think in, in all our countries, it's a, it's a very serious issue. You mentioned we are at war. Um, I'm, I, it's a feeling which prevails in many of our countries. So, uh, of course, it's a question which should arise here too. I'm not sure I understood very well your question about, um, I'm sorry. Consensus issue? Yes, the making, priority. Making speaking with one voice a priority, finally. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, okay, so I did understand it, but I'm not, I don't think I have the answer, I'm afraid. So I, I um, it's again a very political solution, I think, and decision. But uh, how to achieve it, uh, I, I, I will leave it to, <laughs> to Pierre and Bruno, cowardly. Bruno? <laughs> uh, I'll try to answer all questions more or less together. I'll focus a little bit more on yours. Um, well, I, I think the EU has, has a narrative, as, as Pia has been saying. What lacks is a little bit incorporating all the complexity and the mass of, uh, of the world we live in into that narrative and making sense of it. Um, I think uh, Russia and the US are better able to do this. Um, you see how Russian foreign policy sees a frozen conflict as an opportunity. You see how the U.S. sees uh, conflicts all over the world as part of a secular struggle of democracy against its enemies. And so even foreign policy crises are quickly incorporated into their narrative. The EU is a little more uh, focused on itself, it has to open up to the world, has to realize that it's also part of this contemporary effort to shape a new global order. Uh, and has to embrace foreign policy as it's always been for thousands of years, which is dealing with problems. And the fact that a problem is there doesn't show that your foreign policy has failed. It shows that your foreign policy should get working. Uh, and in some cases, there's an opportunity there to pursue our interests or our vision. I do think that our main interest is a certain vision of the world, uh, which, uh, which is uh, based on universalism, based on cosmopolitanism but a sort of universalism and cosmopolitanism which, is, which includes institutions and rules. It's not just a universalism of values, it's a universalism of rules and institutions. And we're in the middle of that process. I think it should be motivating enough for, motivating enough for European foreign policy to be involved in that, uh, in that big project. Uh, trade, uh, maybe over lunch we can talk a little bit about how trade can be a part of this. Uh, I'm very interested personally in trade policy. I think you, you don't have, you shouldn't be as worried as you sounded uh, because geopolitical concerns are more and more a part of the discussion on trade. Um, I hear that more and more in the trade councils. We just have to think about how to do it. But I think the moment when trade was up to DG trade and completely technocratic discussion is long past. And it's how being taken up uh, with a very different and, and better perspective. Pierre. Uh, very quickly, on, <clears throat> on added value that could be brought by member states, yes, definitely, there's no doubt. But 
But we're doing that already to some extent. You know, what I found quite fascinating, and maybe Sylvie, and Sylvie is certainly right, in, in, we're very bad at public relations, but when we launched the fourth generation process with Central African, uh, with our Central African operation, which was, by the way, a peace, um, peacekeeping operation in the middle of Bangui, in a rather difficult place. The first countries who came up and said they were ready to support were the Baltic states. You know, to have the Baltic states going to uh, sending uh, some of their foot soldiers to uh, Central Africa, I guess some of them didn't even know where Central Africa <laughs> was, was, was rather interesting. Could give you another example when we discuss um, how we could move into Mali and, and help there and we needed expertise, we found out that Denmark had an extraordinary expertise on, on, on Mali because of its development policy there for many years. All this shows, if only uh, it was needed to remind that, that we have an extraordinary uh, treasure of expertise in our 28 member states that we don't use enough and that we should do more than that. I think the main problems we have at foreign policy is a very good point that Bruno makes in, in his paper, which is that we're facing three different categories of member states. Those that don't have much ambition anymore in foreign policy, those that are looking at some specific interest, and the large ones who are rather dismissive with, uh, with uh, European foreign policy because they think they can do better. The whole issue of that we're stronger united. Uh, and I think it's how do you bring these three groups together and, and, and try to make them find a, a common way to, to move ahead. And it's complicated. Speaking with one voice, it depends very much on what you're th th thinking about that. If it's trying to have a, a sort of common stance that we can express all together or that we can express with different voices but moving in the same direction. This we can manage more or less. It takes time sometimes, but we can do it. If you're talking about one single representation, I agree with you that we're still very far away from that uh, because member states relish their uh, own single representation in the UN or in different uh, organizations. I'm not even talking about Security Council, of course, with two permanent members. And therefore, I personally think this will be one of the last uh, hurdles that we will overcome because they're very eager and this I can understand. We have to accept this reality that uh, member states still want to be seen and still want to be um, addressed as sovereign state and on some of these um, on, on, on some of the issues. The third question is a very interesting one I think because there's something we have totally forgotten. Uh, we're talking now a lot about Libya and our military operation but do you remember then when before launching the military operation in 2011 in Libya, the two leaders of that intervention, David Cameron and Nicolas Sarkozy, thought that it was important to come to the European Council and ask for its green light and its endorsement. It was a very interesting session, very badly prepared, and therefore it went all over the place. <laughs> But at the end of the day, we had a common line. Of course, everybody forgot about it <coughs> in the next 48 hours with Germany <laughs> abstaining, etc. But it was, we won't go into, into, into a military intervention in, um, in Libya if we don't have a UN Security Council. It's not for the EU to ask for it, for, but for the countries of the region and the Arab League, and they did so. And if, that, if there is an agreement and a positive vote in um, in, uh, in the UN Security Council, then we're ready to go, and those, those who wish to go could go. To have the two leaders from, from UK and France thinking that it was necessary to have the endorsement of the European Council before moving in that direction was quite interesting, I thought. And uh, of course, everything that happened afterwards made everybody forget about this European Council. But it was a very interesting uh, move by these two. And I think if we had more of that in the future, that could be a very interesting way of moving ahead with our, uh, with our uh, foreign, foreign policy. Thank you, Pierre. That was an upbeat note. Sylvie just asked me yeah, whether she can toss uh, in one uh, final comment. One thing which came to my mind, uh, back to the question of uh, PR and, and speaking with one voice, is. Uh, uh, because you mentioned how Russia and the Americans ha speak with one voice, we are there's an area where we should we have a role to play. Now it's this propaganda war and this you know in, 
within this hybrid war, we have this very, very, very strong propaganda war being waged um, on European uh, screens, uh, um, and we have to fight back. Uh, I think we can fight back in a very different way from, from, from the American strategy. We, we, I, I really think there is a European role to play here, and, and we should. I know, I know it's, uh, this task is being taken at European level, but we should put a lot of uh, effort in it. I think it's worth it. Thank you very much. Okay, this, um, uh, this, I'm very thankful for this final comment, not least because it wasn't about Greece, and we really managed to talk for 90 minutes in this town, uh, you know, without mentioning Greece once. Um, brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for your insights. Uh, another little break in this big strategy debate that we're trying to have here in this town uh, about how to improve EU foreign policy. As always, questions are bigger afterwards than they were before, and so, I guess, is the appetite and also the thirst. And this is why we're going to rearrange the building, as always, and serve you food and drinks. Thank you very much for coming and for staying with us over lunch. Um, please stay on, have a discussion with us, and uh, come again next time when an invitation reaches you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.